Hey everybody, Coach Jonathan here, and welcome to a special episode of the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast. About a month ago, we sat down with Team Cliff Bar at their team camp in Napa Valley, California to talk about, well, team camps and to talk about the different things you can get from team camp, depending on the goals and your season and everything else. A common question we get is I have a block of training coming up. How do I fit this into my existing plan? Or how do I get the most out of this training block that I have coming up much like a training camp? So we actually asked a lot of those questions and we dug into a lot of tactics around crit racing. Now, the most interesting part about this episode is that you are going to be able to hear from Cliff Bar in this episode. And next week, you'll be able to hear from a different team on how they use team camps. And we'll also go into some tactics with them. So in this two part training camp series, we hope that you guys can learn how to adjust your training plans or how to adjust your goals for an upcoming camp or vacation where you're going to ride a lot, whatever it may be. Anyways, with that, let's just jump right into it. Thanks everybody. Welcome to the podcast is dedicated to making you a faster cyclist. The ask a cycling coach podcast presented by trainer road I'm coach Jonathan Lee without our head coach, Chad Timmerman, Boo. <laughs> but with our CEO, Nate Pearson. Yes. And we have four special guests with us right now. That's why I said yes. Yeah. This is the latest podcast we've ever recorded. Yeah, it's like 11. Yeah, we're getting there. 10. Yeah, yeah, we're getting there. And we are, once again, if you've listened to, I believe it's episode 21 or 22, that's the first episode that we did with Team Cliff Bar. And we talked all about crit tactics. We're going to talk about more of that today. And we're here at the Cliff Family Winery with the Cliff Bar team. So we're going to introduce some of the guests, then you uh, have an idea of who we're speaking with. Uh, first off, and and Pete, you work for Trainer Road too, do, but, but go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Pete Morris. Uh, I'm a rider for Team Cliff Bar Cycling, and I work at Trainer Road now as a product manager. Sweet. Let's <laughs> uh, JD. Go ahead. Hey, I'm JD Bergman. Uh, Team Cliff Bar Cycling. JD, where do you live? I live in lovely Albany, California. It is the urban village by the bay. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And uh, Pete is in Reno. Yeah. Connor. Uh, Connor Malerby. I'm living in uh, Colorado. Awesome. So, uh, and then I get last one, Owen. That'd be me. I'm Owen Jillett and uh, originally from Australia. So Brisbane back there. Where do you live now? Now I live in San Mateo. So I'm in the Bay area. Cool. San Mateo. Nice man. Um, so we've covered this before, but, and, and Nate, you wanted to get into this too, but kind of identifying what, uh, the team is and what, where it ranks, I guess, in terms of, cause you guys don't race the tour de France. What do you, what does the team specialize in? Not, not this year. <laughs> we're, we're holding out for that one. <laughs> what does the team specialize in? Uh, so we're, we're definitely a, a crit centric team. Um, yeah. Right. JD is making crit only. Yeah. Crit criteria. <laughs> we, we focus on criteriums, uh, around the country and locally and regionally. Um, but definitely we would always pretty much choose a crit over a road race. Uh, so, could I call you guys like a domestic pro team that focuses on crits? Is you, that a good way? You could, but you'd be wrong. <laughs> what, 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 what's, so, what's the right way to say it? So our manager likes to call us a domestic elite program. Okay. Um, the the thing I usually try to use when I'm talking to people is we're kind of like college football players. So like it's kind of a big deal and some people like it, but it's not the pros. Yep. Gotcha. And so you guys have regular jobs too, right? Pretty much, yeah. 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 Yeah, the majority. Right, Pete, you right, definitely right, do. I definitely do. <laughs> uh, I, I do think I think everybody on the team has a real job. It might not be forty hours, but everybody has a, a real job that they get paid to do, uh, in addition to bicycle racing. And then you guys are heavily sponsored. I, I see like I don't know two hundred thousand dollars of bikes in this room. Yeah. Um. What, what do you guys ride? Uh, we ride Argon eighteens. Uh, this year, uh, we've we've spread and now some of us have uh Gall- the new gallium pro discs um most of us are still racing the nitrogen i think all of us will still race the nitrogen which makes sense since you guys mostly do crit bikes and the nitrogen or crit races and the nitrogen is the aero bike right correct yeah that makes sense um now, and then you guys are obviously you ride for cliff bar and plenty of an envy and and pro logo and capo and plenty of other brands too that um like high end brands. So what I want to just back up here is the JD said that, uh, like college, not the pros, you guys still race pro, you still race with pros and yeah. you're still at that top level. Yeah, you right? race the pro field against other major exactly. pro teams, but you don't want to call yourselves pros. So imagine a college football team plays in the NFL. Yeah. That's what we're getting at here. That's a pretty good assumption of yep. what it is. 
Yeah. We win about as much as those college football teams win. <laughs> <laughs> also a pretty good assumption. <laughs> so, but here's the thing. So we want to talk about training camps mm -hmm. because that's where we're at right now is, is your camp here in Napa Valley. And at the same time, we're also, and you'll hear from this later in this podcast, uh, that we're also with uh, the Mark Pro team and they're just over the hill in Marin and they're having a training camp with a very different purpose. So we want to talk about this because a, a common question that I see Nate every week is mm -hmm. I've got this long group or this, this week of, of riding vacation or a team camp or a block of training. How do I then fit that into my training? How do I prioritize things or understand how this is going to mm -hmm. make me faster? That sort of a thing. Or it's a group like this. So how many people are in this house? Like how many people came to this camp? 16, 17, 16, 17. So it's a big group. Mm -hmm. Um, and the vibe here, it's. I was trying to think of like what the vibe is. It's not for fraternity is the wrong word. Cause I think fraternity of like a little bit too rambunctious, but yeah. it's almost like you guys were all friends in college. You went away for six years and now you rented a house in Napa and are <laughs> yeah. staying together. Yeah. But there's, it's not what I would think of as like a pro training camp. Cause there's whiskey on the table and every person, but Jonathan at dinner had a beer. Yeah. Right. Like everyone yep. did. A lot of goofing around and making fun of each other, and like some, a lot. And something to note on the yeah, like nobody's rolling around with 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 you know body fat calipers and all that stuff. But something to note is what, and I think what you're getting at, Nate, is that it's no less effective. It's serving well, a different purpose, right? Yeah, different goals, right? So it seems, um, Pete, you you said like there was a different name of it. What what did you call it? Not a training camp? Yeah. So we definitely call this team camp, not training camp. And we've got many other things we're trying to do here, like. We always organize all of the sponsor goods um, and make sure our bikes are dialed, make sure our kits are dialed, make sure everything we show up to a race is proper and exactly what we're supposed to be doing. Um, and then a lot of media uh, responsibilities, whether it's pictures or videos or podcasts, um, we, we try to capitalize on having everyone around at one time. And then definitely the other, the other goal is to team build while we're here. Um, and luckily that also includes bike riding most of the time <laughs> while we're here. Um, but generally I would say bike riding ranks lower than the other priorities we have to do. How much, how much riding are you guys going to do? Uh, hopefully a lot more this year. Last year was my first year on the team and, uh, pretty sure we drank more beer than we did ride. So, uh, <laughs> hopefully, um, I'd be happy with like four hours, three to four hours a day, three to four hours a day over how many days? Uh, what are we here for three days, four days? Yeah. Uh, and then on Monday, you're going to race a crit, right? Yeah. So I'd say good luck with that. I'd say if we get 10 hours over the four day weekend, that would be about as much as you could expect. I kind of, it, for this me, particular camp. I mean, I mean, you guys are going faster, but when I think of like a, a local, like kind of a fun group that would go do a training camp together, this is the exact same vibe, right? Yeah. Cause that's usually not about being as fast as possible where I think the next camp we go to might be different. Yeah. But you guys are just more about hanging out, having fun. Are you going to like, like hurt each other though while you race? Like when you ride, like will people throw down? I yeah. think when we ride, yes, it's very much you throw down, but it's not in the same sense that other team camps are where you're fighting to get selected. This is more like we're out here trying to hurt each other just to, you know, Prove who's the man. So how <laughs> do you guys know then when, because I, you, uh, someone told me today that only like six to eight people can go to a race and you have 16. How do you guys know who should be at a race and who shouldn't be at a race? Because you want the fast, you guys want the fastest team there every time, right? Yeah, always. I mean, I guess it's up to the director a fair bit as well to decide, but you know, people come in and out of fitness, people get injured. It's that kind of thing. So I also think it, it luckily with this team, everybody is pretty honest. And there's definitely uh, some self-responsibility where if you are not fast enough to go to a race, you are supposed to bow out or not, not select yourself to go to the race. And I think everybody knows everyone else well enough here that we kind of, uh, everybody's honest and everybody only volunteers themselves for races that they should be going to. And then it's still a hard selection. There's still always more guys that want to go to the race than can go. But um what, what's the range of fitness uh, like uh, like right a camp? Now or in the season? <laughs> I like to see both because, um, yeah, we'll talk about that in a second. But, yeah, both. There's right now early season. We're in February, right? So there's 16 people here. What Without naming names, 
You don't have to, but like, what's the watt per kilo or maybe raw watts? Because I, th- I think it's really interesting at a pro level uh, what you would be at. Yeah. Who's the strongest? Let's do that first. Well, we didn't name names, but what kind uh, of power? Stefan. Stefan. Yeah, you can Ste- say names. We can say st- it's Stefan. That's a nice way. <laughs> okay. And what's Stefan uh, do, you think? Uh, he just did the ramp test uh, okay. twice. Uh, the first time he got th- 395 and the second time he got 400. Okay, um, as back, his as his end goal, and he's probably 190 pounds or 180, probably close to 190. Um, but he's also he's a sprinter. I mean, technically, that's what uh, he's supposed to be. He's supposed to be a sprinter. So yeah, let's talk about that. AJ, you just gave like this kind of quizzical look. JD, JD, sorry, no problem. <laughs> sorry, AJ is also short, but he has longer hair. <laughs> JD, what do you mean by that? Like sort of a sprinter. So sprinter is half kind of like physical prowess and then half like mental knowing how to get to the line and knowing how to surf the pack and knowing it's a chess game when to do your effort. Yeah, totally. And so for years I would always be the last guy up the hill, every hill at training camp. And then I would always be the first guy to finish every race. And a lot of it is just kind of race craft and like, Mm-hmm. And it's teaching those guys that stuff. And now that we've got Kevin and Connor and Zach and now Owen on the team, like we've got a much like better range of experience mm-hmm. in that sprinting arena. Something interesting. So what we're getting at here with this, or at least what I'm grasping from this is the fact that there are different objectives, uh, dare I say different measures of success, Pete, I think yeah. I'm yeah. quoting you yeah. from yeah. the video that we have with you, but <laughs> I think that there are different objectives with a team camp. Uh, one that, and I, I, I would venture a guess is to say that if you didn't have this time together as a team to get to know each other, because Owen, are, are you new on the team this year? Yes, yeah, so this is actually my first year on this team. Perfect. So, you mean, there are people on this team that have no clue who Owen is um, until just today, right? This is true. Yeah. <laughs> so, going to a race and you see Owen on the roster and you have no clue who Owen is, and then you come into that, I assume that this time that you have to spend to get familiar with each other proves beneficial in a race. Have you had a situation or have you, do you guys notice that? Does that change how you race uh, this time that you spend together? Yeah, I would say absolutely. I think, I think the most important part about team camp is like getting to know everybody and we ought, we do race on Monday. So we'll, we'll probably have 10 people in the race and that's the first chance to race with the new guys and reacquaint yourself with all your teammates who've been racing. Luckily, we pretty much know everybody who's been on the team and how they race and how they ride. Um, but I think like the team building um, enables you to race harder for your teammates or you know elevate yourself to a different level. Um, and so that's where the team camaraderie from team camp shows up is at the races. Yeah, it's not just about because and, and if if the team camp justifies this for sure, but it's not always just about a fitness test, right? And it's not always about everybody showing up and seeing who's the most fit. And and I think that this is something for us amateur, all of us Joes listening to this. I think that we should take note of this too, because when you have a, a, a club that you're a part of or a team or whatever else, or just a group of friends, I think that there's a ton of value you can get from going into this. And the common question that we get a lot of people, they're wondering about the implications to their training. And we'll get to that in just a bit. Mm-hmm. But I think that if you can change your focus at least and recognize the fact that this is a good opportunity for you to build relationships that can then help you improve education on racecraft, but then also implementation, right? Because you know how to work together. So, so I want some, I want some more of the numbers. Let's go back to Stefan. He's at, so he's at 400 right now. What will he be when you guys are kind of in season? He's, I, he's probably 5% faster or, you know, you, you, I figure 5%. He's pretty good then right now. Yeah. He's pretty good. Um, let's yeah. talk about the other end. Cause I don't know if everyone else is coming in at like, you know, that kind of peak fitness. Yeah. What would be kind of like the lower, um, the end with, without naming names this time. Just because I'm sure people want to know, because everyone's thinking right now, everyone's at 400 watt FTP. That seems insane. Yeah. So I'll I'll throw myself under the bus. My threshold is 340 or 345, which is uh, that's good. Atrocious. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And so, so for me, that's not very good. Uh, uh, And I weigh 207 pounds, and for for Nate, uh, which is a lot. Um, And uh, so I'm definitely probably on the lower end of the fitness. I got this sweet new job, which is awesome. But uh, I think 
for me, Team Camp is a nice like motivator and Kickstarter for me where you don't remember how fast you need to ride until you get to Team Camp. Um, and so I, I definitely have been training consistently, not a, not a lot, but on the other end of the spectrum, a lot of people use Team Camp to reacquaint themselves with what hard riding really is. <laughs> That's so. That's an interesting point. Some people are coming into team camp and they're going to be looking to to polish off fitness that's already prepared, and and utilize the time spent together to really test that out. But in your case, you're looking at this. Uh, what would you like to see out of this in terms of fitness gains? What would you like to see out of team camp, or is that even something that you are chasing at this point? Yeah, I mean, this will still be an awesome weekend of riding. I mean, if we do ten hours, that's that's a pretty big week for me. So. Um, I, it's always beneficial to ride and I'll definitely come out of team camp faster pretty much no matter how much we ride. Um, and it's also the other things like bumping shoulders with the JD when we're riding around. It's the, it's the other regular race craft stuff that you need to need to work on. Um, so it, it's both, it reminds you what racing and what riding with your team feels like after a long winter of either riding by yourself or riding on the trainer. Um, and, uh, yeah, the fitness is definitely going to come, and I always use this as kind of the kickstart to my training. Hmm. So you're not specifically chasing an, an adaptation, a number, or anything else like that with this. And that's something that can be, that's that's a good example or an opposing example, I think, what is the first inclination for a lot of people when they think about their team camp is that they want to see X, like they, they want to see a specific benefit from it that's something in terms of like measurable with fitness. Well, so. I like the idea too, though, that it's the kind of the starting of your fitness. So you're 207 right now and 345. What would you be when you're fit? Uh, I would say I'll probably be 195 and 380, 390, 400 if it's a good year. Why are you guys so big, <laughs> right? Like what cycling pro team has people this big? People to put out power. Power? Oh, and you talked about this before. Uh, right before we talked, like you said, say what you said before. Yeah. So I've always been the biggest guy on every team I'm on. I'm, you know, generally float around the 150 mark and I'm, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. I, I float around 150 pounds. I'm about five feet 11 and I'm always on the bigger end of the spectrum. I'm a heavy guy. Come on this team and I'm looking up and, you know, all of a sudden I'm the small guy on the team. So, you know, I feel like I've got to start packing on to keep up. Yeah. And that's interesting, packing on to keep up. That's another team dynamic when you come together as a team like that, recognizing the fact that if perhaps you've fulfilled a different role with a different team, now moving into the new one and getting to know everybody at team camp, that can then help you understand how you can fill into that role. Yeah. Can we talk about roles and maybe some tactics too? Because I think everyone loves tactics from you guys. Yeah. Always fun. Tactics Let's go through the best. roles. Or like what, what kind of roles do you guys play in a race like in a crit? I think it changes with like every race, you know, everyone has their own strengths. Um, you know, I like to sprint, JD likes to sprint, every, like everyone, everyone has their own specific thing that they do well and everyone knows that they can do that well. So we go into the races all knowing relatively what everyone can do and where everyone's fitness levels is at. So it's kind of, you can make it the best plan, but it goes out the door the second you start racing. Connor, how about you? Yeah, I like to be like a super uh, aggressive racer. Yeah, I try to get in the breakaways and such. And um, then if I realize that's not working, I like to be one of the last few lead out guys for our sprinters. Like I have a decent sprint, but I would not classify myself as a pure sprinter. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I can definitely help our sprinters get down to the finish. Like Owen this year with Owen and Zach, I'm really looking forward to like uh, being the last few guys leading those guys into the finish. So, um, So would you then... If you were racing with two sprinters, would you still try to attack early on or would you just kind of feel out the race? Uh, I'd feel it out for a little, but uh, I don't know. I just get impatient and I always just like want to attack, attack, attack and <laughs> make it as hard as possible. But uh, I also like when it comes down to a field sprint as well, just like the last 10 laps and like how hectic it is and like how much you have to come together as a team and all that. And I just love that stuff. So we have two sprinters. Wow. Go ahead. So one more thing on that too is like we kind of have to attack. Because we don't necessarily have the firepower to bring back breaks if they go. And so we've got to be in front of that so that we don't have to chase it back. Because uh, if we get in a situation where 10 strong guys are up the road and we've got two sprinters, we, we, we just can't. We, we just up. can't do it. Yeah. So That's interesting. So that changes the tactic. I could see a lot of people actually having a similar scenario where they have 
like it, I'm thinking of like local club teams where it'll be a group of guys and, and two guys, perhaps the, the, you know, they'll, they'll be the, the sprinters, so to speak on that team. That's a really good point is to make sure that you, you don't get caught without somebody up the road like that in a situation like that. Good so takeaway. How does attacking prevent a breakaway of strong people from forming? Oh, it doesn't necessarily. But if you have a guy in that breakaway mm. and you know you have two sprinters back in the field, that guy doesn't have to do anything. Okay. And so if that breakaway stays away, you've got a fresh guy against whoever is in that breakaway. And then if it doesn't come back because that guy's not cooperating, then you're fine with that because that's a whole chunk of time in the race that something couldn't go up the road without one of us. So Connor, would you actually try to establish the break or would you like try to bridge up or if there is a move, try to come like get in right away? Yeah. I like to probably more establish the break, you know, um, and then see who's in there and figure out what I'm going to do. Like I'll feel confident in my ability to sprint out of a small group, but I don't, uh, when it comes down to a field sprint, I'm not going to be there. Like that's why we got like Owen and Zach and JD to finish it off. So so I think we have two sprinters here, and I think, Pete, you were on the lead-out train, right, before? Yeah, I'm kind of the diesel for the five laps to go to two laps to go Perfect. or something. Perfect. Yeah. And then, Connor, because I don't think we've ever covered it, Jonathan. No breakaway, five laps to go, and um, Pete's at the front pulling everything. What What do you guys want to see and not want to see? Well, let's just say somebody else. Since yeah. 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 We don't want to see Pete on. We want, yeah. we want some other team on the front, Okay. and we want Pete like fifth wheel next to the line of guys at the front so with the, uh, the other three, four guys behind Pete. Why wouldn't you want Pete on the front at five laps to go? Cause he can't stay out there for four laps. He can try, but y yeah. it's a long way to go. This idea that you would, you would use up Pete too early. Yeah. So like it, Pete can sit next to a train using, you know, a half draft for those laps. Mm -hmm. and save us in a full draft. Whereas if it's full single file for the first 20 guys, then either we're way too far back or we had to fight really hard to get up there. And let's say then an attack happens at five laps to go and you guys are in that great position. What do you guys do? I'd say that's when we tell Pete to go. <laughs> okay. And then you tell Pete to chase it down. Yeah. If you know, it's whoever's on the front there. Unfortunately, sometimes it happens. It falls on them. They've just got to cover the gap. We can't let anything that late in the race go. So, you know, in that scenario, we'd use Pete to close that gap and then he'd just ride as long as he could. So then you guys would come up in his draft and he would pull you along? Exactly. And then hopefully, you know, if we did burn him chasing that move, we'd then tuck back in behind the other, you know, another team. If there was no other team there, unfortunately, you know, that's kind of our hand is a bit forced. Mm -hmm. Would you ever wait for like another team to cover that and then try to get behind them? Or would you just... I think it's too late in the race. I, it, either either the other team's going to cover it right away and it's going to be obvious um, that they're going to do the work or it's going to be too late and if it's a threatening move, it's worth burning me up to bring him back um, and have the rest of the guys still have a chance. Um, so I think either either another team takes responsibility right away, like if the five guys in front of me or that I'm next to wind it up and bring it back, then that's all the better. And they used up their guys faster, probably too soon. And maybe we have a better shot just like that. Um, and if they don't do it and they start floundering, then it's pretty much my job as we're, we have just as good of a shot if, if I bring it back as anyone else. So it's, it's my job to bring that back. So let's say there wasn't a break. How long until you would say, you know, whoever's leading your train, get out in front and make it go really fast. So there's no more attacks. Yeah. That actually happened this year at Boise. Like exact situation that we're talking about there's say six seven laps to go uh but it sounds easy to sit back and let another uh team take control uh -huh. but like you're sitting you're sitting back but you're bashing elbows heads and everything so it's almost easier for us to make our own train next to it so at boise this year you had uhc you had silence and then you had us and then for um for us, like it was three of us, Pete, Kevin, and I rotating with Zach on our wheel. So with six laps, the three of us are rotating it, like 10 seconds at a time. And this know? is as hard as you can go. I oh, mean, you, sure. you, you are going, you are maxed out, uh, trading 
are you sw like trading poles, hitting elbows, hitting heads, going through corners. Every single 10 seconds is as hard as you can go for six laps. And, and uh, yeah. do you guys have people on the back of, so the three in the front are switching, then you have like spinners behind that? Yeah, we had one. Ideally, I mean, obviously we would want our train longer, mm -hmm. but uh, you're competing against these bigger teams that have that. And uh, so it makes a lot harder work for us. And we, we only had one sprinter and three workers. So we, we actually burned out with one lap to go. And so we dropped, Zach was able to slot in at like eighth wheel or so, but then he's fighting elbows with other trains. So it's definitely not ideal situation, but. Is that the, what's the cutoff point for when a team should start its own train versus just like be in with everybody else? Yeah, it's tough. There have been races where we have lapped the field and then we put the train together and it's a slow train, but because we've got five guys in a row, no one wants to fight us for it. Mm -hmm. And those situations are great because one, we're not actually going that hard. And two, we don't have to fight for a position because we've got the guy on the front. Um, but that doesn't happen all that often. Yeah. And so like, if it's really fast, it, it kind of comes down to like, the same reason that we put guys in the breakaway early is because we don't have that firepower for that big, long wind up sort of sprint. And so we have to kind of play off of other teams or, you know, just time our acceleration really late. But in Boise, you did it because it was just positioning was bad. It, positioning was just so critical because that race is just fast, fast, fast. Mm -hmm. And there's no like, it's not like you can move up 30 spots with two laps to go and sprint. Uh, there, it's like where you are with 10 laps to go, you're fighting for that whole last 10 laps, and everyone's fighting for that whole last 10 laps because wherever you are, that's where you can only go backwards. There's no coming up. So when you guys then, sorry, I'm just, I, have, I have all these questions. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> um, let's say we're not, okay, let's forget about the train because I think a lot of local people, they don't have a train, right, for their own team going through. Mm -hmm. So let's say you're... <clears throat> Your sprinters, two laps to go, one lap to go. Are where, where are you trying to be? Like where, where in the field are you trying to be? And we're talking no train. No train. Yeah, you're trying to be on someone else's train. Okay. <laughs> and if there's no other, you know, train there, I, I often find myself just kind of floating near the front. So definitely within the top fifteen for sure. You never want to be, you know, on the front. Obviously, if you're a sprinter, it's not a place to be until you cross the finish line. But you're always like floating around there, just trying to draft off people and keep forward momentum. So you're trying to flow through the bunch without actually ever hitting the wind. Last year when Owen wasn't on the team, I tried really hard to be on his wheel oh, because really? uh, <laughs> he was really good at smoothly getting through the pack and not letting other big name teams cut him off, even though he didn't necessarily have teammates. Yeah. All right. What do you, how do you do that? Um, that's a very good question. I think that's something that, you know, my dad taught me back when I was learning how to ride, but the last couple of years, I just haven't had solid lead out trains or solid lead out guys. So I've spent a lot of time, you know, developing how to just float through the bunch. And a lot of that is just, you know, group rides on the weekends and just riding in bunches and figuring out how the flow of a bunch works and how to just work your way to the front without actually doing any work. You know, sometimes the holes get a little bit tight and you can't quite, you know, fit through there with your handlebars but it is what it is you know you just you find your way to the front you just got to keep flowing it's always about forward momentum that's the that's the key well that's what your elbows are for when your handlebars don't fit exactly that's true yeah, yeah. you just get people out of the way but, <laughs> so one of the other things that i think about a lot as uh, not as great sprinter is kind of what type of sprinter you are so i'm a much punchier sort of sprinter and so i like a s relatively slower race with a bigger acceleration at the end whereas some sprinters like a really high speed lead out fast 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 and then just a smaller acceleration right at the end exactly and that's where we're two completely different sprinters i prefer to you know sprint from a higher speed and again that's the the whole floating through the bunch for me whereas you know Jetty comes off from a slower sprint because he's got a lot more power, you know, quick acceleration. So do you guys learn that about each other at like at, at team camp and just hanging out or is it in the races or? Yeah, it's a combination of everything, I'd say. You know, you see people out there riding, like, like I said, this is my first year, but I know relatively how everyone on the team already rides because I've seen them at races. I've seen them, you know, training before. So you kind of, you see, see how it happens and just the dynamic we all have. I, th I would say it's really our... Uh pool that uh, the national caliber 
of crit racers is actually very small. Everybody pretty much knows everyone in our kind of little pond of there's maybe like 300 or 400 crit racers in the whole US that are worth knowing about and you eventually end up racing almost everybody. So you just kind of know your your general knowledge of of national caliber crit racers it just fills in. Hmm. Would you guys like so if it was a really fast sprint, would you be helping Owen? Or do you guys just, because sprints are so crazy, you just both try to go for it? Or how does that work? So generally, no, going into the race, what type of sprint it's going to be. Mm -hmm. So like a Boise is almost always a high speed, kind of drag racy sort of sprint. And then uh, like Dana Point, for example, is a really uh, position-y, acceleration-y sort of a sprint. And so different kind of, uh, skill sets. So that's crazy. Cause I bet you most like lo local amateur riders never think about that, right? They say I'm a sprinter, uh, and I just sprint. Yeah, go ahead. I'd say honestly, before every race, sit down, look at the course, you know, look at the Strava profile, map my ride, that kind of stuff. Really study the course. It makes a world of difference at the end. Like if you know what's coming up and you know what, even the wind direction, that can make a world of difference. So study the courses and it makes a huge difference in the end. And you can really, you can work on your tactics a lot better coming into the final. Bringing this full circle, I, I think that this proves an important part for amateurs to understand what type of, what, so an amateur might consider themselves a climber, might consider themselves a sprinter, might consider themselves whatever other role you want to assign to them. But Pete, you, you mentioned this, that you thought you were a sprinter until you moved up with the fast dudes. And I think that all of us think that, you know, when you first start cycling and you start out and you watch the Tour de France and you see somebody go up mm. a hill on, and then you go out and do it, you're probably like, I'm a climber. Yeah. You know? <laughs> oh, it's, but yeah. You it's wherever you like the most, right? Yeah. It's like, I'm that like that person. And then you find out later on <laughs> that maybe you're not that good, but that's okay. Um, I, I think that a team is a great opportunity for you to discover specific strengths and weaknesses because you get to work so closely with other people like that. And when I think about a team camp, I think that if your goal is just to chase like a fitness goal or anything else, and you somehow overlook that type of contextual learning about yourself as a racer, I feel like uh, you've perhaps missed a bit of the opportunity that you could get with a team camp. And I think that's like a really powerful thing about this team camp is the fact that there's I, I've spent time with other or spent time with other teams and I don't feel that they know each other this intimately. And I think that that's a really powerful thing. And that's why you, one of the reasons why you guys are such good crit yeah. racers. There are hugs, right? You guys meet each other and you hug each other. Yeah. Like yeah, I, yeah, exactly. I don't do that with my local teams. <laughs> well, and, and uh, a lot, I mean, I mean I'm not, I want been, to, but yeah. <laughs> just don't, it's not the culture. Right. And teams yeah. that I've been with, you know, it's like, it's like a head nod or a distant handshake yeah. and, and it's a formality rather than something that's a little more. And, and, uh, but a team that can actually race together. Yeah, sure. You'll be more effective, but it can help each person learn more about the, their actual strengths and weaknesses. Can I take like five more minutes? I just want to finish the yeah, sprint. Sure okay. Thing. JD, <laughs> right, we I'm still so haven't upset. finished, did we? <laughs> yeah, we haven't finished yet. We haven't won the race yet. Yeah. JD, you said, um, it was a different skill set between a high 30 mile per hour finish or something fast like that than a slow, fast spin up. How is that a different skill set? Uh, well, so you kind of like, if you look at the pro tour, you've got guys like Kittle who can probably go 42 miles an hour and then jump to 45. And then you've got guys like Cavendish who will thread a needle and he'll be going 30 and then he'll be instantly going 39. Mm -hmm. And so they both win a ton of races, but in really different mm, ways. I got that. So when you guys are coming up to, and we, we went back and you're at the very end and you're kind of floating through the field, Owen, how hard are you working? Ideally, not at all. Yeah, really? Yeah, like you're still putting uh, pressure on the pedals, but for the most part, as long as you're in the wind, you're trying to conserve as much energy as possible. And being a sprinter, you need to conserve it for that one explosive effort because that's all you have. You know, putting some science to that, we just talked about this in the last podcast. We talked about creatine phosphate stores and mm -hmm. how they're jet fuel and there's not much of them in those yep. muscles. And I think that that's one of the things your main things you're trying to conserve, right? Is that, that, that kick is what we usually call it or that punch that you need to be able to get across the line. Yeah. So when I'm looking at a race afterwards, like when I download my file or whatever, one of the things that's a benchmark of a race that I've done well is how much time I've coasted. And like the more zeros I have in my power file, the better I did. That's more what sprinters look for. 
Which is just, funny because that's the total opposite of what most cyclists would assume, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I would be the complete opposite of these guys, you know? Like, I'm trying to make their job 10 times easier. Like, I'm the one that wants the higher power profile throughout the race. Like, I want them to be at zero while I'm at my max, you know, to make their job easier. I'm not, I'm not looking for the win. I'm, I want one of these guys to win. And obviously, when they win, the whole team wins. So, like, I don't, like... I sacrifice my race for these guys' results, but it's a team effort. And like, so I don't mind like killing myself in those last five laps. I'm not gonna say with a lap to go, I'm done, two laps to go, I'm done. But like, I'm stoked with that. Like, yeah. That's, that's so cool, right? Like that's a, that's a team and that's another thing. Sorry, local, local racers don't do that, right? I, I've been on um, a bunch of teams and it always seems like it's never working together. It's more like a bunch of guys with the same jersey in a field. Right. Rather than than like I've been had people, they chase down each other's brakes. Right. Like they're at the front and they're pulling down and someone else is up the road. Yeah. Even the races we do, you get a fair amount of that. <laughs> that oh, really? still definitely happens. Yeah. Is that because like um, individual egos, somebody wants to win or just lack of know how? Yeah, I'd say it's a, it's a mix of more of the latter yeah. for me. Yeah, no. I mean, I. I don't, I don't necessarily see other teams where the guys are like, oh, I'm going to do it. No, I'm going to do it. Yeah. I think it's more just like, oh, I thought I was helping you. And oh, they that didn't realize. kind of situation where yeah. they're, they're not necessarily doing it maliciously, but they just don't know any better. I think that's too when I've, I've seen it happen. People go, oh, I didn't know I was not supposed to do that. Yeah, right? but I think also like the dynamic of this team is different. I feel like some other guys on different teams at races, they're also still fighting for roster positions for future races throughout the calendar. So like some races or teams I've been on before, like your manager might not be at the race, but he just looks at the results and he's like, oh, these guys finished wow. top three on the team. So they're going to go to the fallen race. And like, they don't know what you did. Not, yeah, it's, it's yeah. so unfair. So like, I have one last question. Okay, you're in there. You're, you're coming up with a sprint. You haven't put any power out yet for the entire race. When do you know when to go? Um, I'd say you just feel it. Like if you've, you've done the course a million times, if it's a crit, you've ridden past the finish line at least 20 times now. You just know. The timing's right, everything, it just feels good. You put the power down and you know when you know. I think, I think lastly, everybody has a, the, an amount of time where they should spend their energy to give them the best chance of winning. So like with JD, that's 10 seconds. With Owen, that might be 15 or 20 second long sprint. Like Connor's probably a 45 minute guy. <laughs> and I'm like a 10 minute guy. Like that's my best chance of winning is I've, if I'm with five other guys with 10 minutes to go in a race and we're going super hard. And like, so everybody has to turn a race into the best chance for them to win. And so with sprinters, especially like JD's not gonna jump from the last corner. He's gonna, he's gonna launch from hundred meters to go where Owen could maybe launch from the last corner and Connor's gonna get in the first break of the race <laughs> and win. And we're gonna do like the hail, I'll do the hail Mary with 10 laps to go or 20 laps to go. So it's, it's knowing when you, knowing how you can win is, makes it much more successful racing. Is that just through experience with racing? Like, oh, and you say you just know, is that just because you've been in like over probably a hundred crits? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, probably well more than that, to yeah. be honest. 500 crits? <laughs> I've I don't know. done, you know, maybe a hundred in one year. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Wow. It's as, definitely as a junior, you know, it gets drilled into you. as, you know, my coach used to walk me around the track beforehand and he's like, this is where I want you to sprint. And, you know, it would always be a set distance that he'd know that I could, you know, do well from. So it definitely, you need to do a lot of recon. I was speaking earlier about, you know, looking at the course beforehand. That makes such a world of difference. If you know the course, you know, even use Google Street View, things like that. Look at the course, look at the corners, figure out exactly what works best for you. And, you know, from there, all you can do is your best. Yeah, because uh, like, like Pete said, like Owen's going to want to go at 100 meters, maybe 200 meters max, like, for me, if, I, if I'm going for my race, I'm looking at three to four laps to go. Like, I'll get destroyed if I go at 200 laps to go, but at, or 200 meters. 200 meters, sorry. <laughs> That's a but, long race. That is a long, long race. But, uh, it's Daytona. <laughs> they call it, yeah. But like three to four laps to go, I have a chance of winning. Like, so. That brings up the importance of a team, right? In the sense that otherwise you're, you're limited to your outcomes just based on exactly what you have the fitness to be able to pull off or working together as a team, then you can, you know, put the person with the best 
I, or I should say the fitness profile that matches the course and, and the way you anticipate the race to unfold, you can actually then work all together to support whatever that plan is. What so. you guys do sounds like so much fun if it wasn't so scary. <laughs> <laughs> it is fun. Yeah. You know, it is also scary. scary. Yeah. <laughs> that's the difference right there, I think. That's the difference, right? Yeah. Yep, that's it. Well, thanks, guys. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, I know that this weekend isn't a big race. Uh, good luck at that. But of course, good luck at all the other races throughout uh, the rest of the calendar. If you show up at any of the larger crits like Athens or, or geez, Tulsa, Tough, Boise, plenty of other races, if you see a cliff kit, this year they're blue instead of red. If you see the blue kit, uh, make sure to not just cheer them on with everything you have, but come and say hi because they're very personable guys. So, yeah, Lots thank of you. IPAs here. And that's right. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Always happy to have a chat and a beer. That's right. Thanks, guys. We appreciate it. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you.